Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our third week of our crop hour series for 2023. And this week, uh, we'll be discussing wheat and small grains. And uh, I'm David Karki, agronomy field specialist. Uh, I'm based out of Watertown, and and I'll be moderating your today's program and also um, tomorrow and Thursday's program as well. Uh, tomorrow and Thursday, we'll be discussing uh, wheat diseases, um, PVP or seed certification. And also we have uh, oats discussion and wheat nitrogen requirement on Thursday, but let's start with today. Uh, and today's day is, um, we'll be talking about insect pest, um, economically important insect pest in, in, on wheat. And Dr. Adam Varenhorst is our um, speaker today. And Dr. Varenhorst joined STSU Extension in 2015. Uh, and without further ado, I'll let Adam introduce a little more um, if he chooses to do, do so, and I'll, I'll get off. But before I go off, uh, there are a couple of things uh, I would like to kind of bring you to your note is there is a Q&A a function which shows like a little chat box in the middle of your screen on the bottom. You can use that anytime during um, Dr. Varenhorst's presentation to, to type in any questions or queries you have or comments. Uh, and, and we'll go through those at the, at the, end, of the end of the presentation. And also if you're le be needing uh, CCA credits or CEUs uh, for your certif ag agronomy certification, we'll pull up a QR code at the end of the, end of the presentation and you can scan that um, through the crop certification app that you have, you probably have already downloaded in your phone. And if you have any questions, please, um, you know, come, you know, have a question on the chat box and that as well. Um, Adam, uh, it's, uh, I will, I'll hand over the microphone to you. All right, thanks, David. All right, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending. As uh, David mentioned, I'll be speaking primarily today about true armyworm caterpillars, as they're one of those insect pests that seem to show up every year here in South Dakota uh, and cause some headaches, as well as aphids. And uh, based on last year's, uh, some of the situations we ran into, some cutworm management in wheat. I'll also be covering a few other insects and their relatives, that a lot of times can show up in South Dakota and may be an issue as we move into 2023. So the true army worm gets its name because of how the large populations will move field to field. And so a lot of times they're said to move like little armies. They hit a field, remove as much tissue as they can, and then they move to the next field. And there have been historical reports of the populations of this pest being so severe that it actually makes roads and highways slick uh, because so many caterpillars are getting ran over that it uh, turns the road a little bit greasy and then accidents happen. So to give you an idea, they, they do move in very large populations uh, in search for food. And so if we go a little bit into this pest though, we can learn that they migrate from the Southern US and being in South Dakota, you can imagine they don't show up here right away in the spring. As a result of them starting in the southern U.S., that's where they overwinter and the moths start moving northward on winds in the spring. Uh, one of the things that happens is they slowly hit our states to the south before they get to us. And typically they show up here in South Dakota sometime in early July is when we start observing the first caterpillars. So you can imagine that's when we're getting uh, into mid to late, uh, depending on exactly when they show up uh, wheat season. And uh, they have three pairs of true legs for identification. Most cat, all caterpillars will have these. This is the part uh, that not all caterpillars will have. They have four pairs of pro legs. And if we look at these, and these are not always easy to see, they have these black lines uh, near the base of each of those pro legs. Probably the most important characteristic to look for on this caterpillar though is the head capsule. And if we look, they typically have kind of a brownish head capsule, but it's these dark lines, as you can see in these pictures, a little bit harder in these. A true army worm will always have this network of dark lines. It almost looks like somebody took an ink pen and started scribbling on their head. And so that's what we look for, because as we can see here, the color can vary uh, from these different pictures uh, 
these were taken from the same field. Uh, so you can see there's a darker uh, color variant and then a lighter color variant. They will all have this orange stripe. Uh, they have orange stripes on their sides, but uh, that can vary a little bit in how bright the secondary stripe is. But this one's always pretty bright. But there are other army worms that have similar color uh, patterns and the stripes can be fairly similar. So my recommendation is always to look for the head and see uh, what that looks like. So aside from these showing up in potentially very large populations, another major issue is what we've seen in South Dakota is they will feed on the leaves of grasses. They almost exclusively will go for grasses. I've seen these in a waterway of a soybean field uh, that had been, it was a newer waterway, so it had been sown with oats uh, as well as some grasses. Uh, the waterway was clear cut and the soybeans on either side of the waterway were just fine. Uh, they will also attack corn, uh, but by the time they show up in South Dakota, corn's pretty much out of that window of where we worry about having something feeding on the leaves and also uh, the leaves of corn as it gets older become tougher and a lot of times caterpillars have a lot harder time with that. So one of the crops that we do see them showing up in in South Dakota is wheat and the timing of it is pretty detrimental for a lot of the fields because they'll start on the leaves and if we haven't uh, reached soft dough yet in the these caterpillars feed on the flag leaf we can see yield losses associated with that. So that can be a problem in and of itself. We've seen where these will wipe out entire patches of a field. Uh, it looks like a hailstorm went through. Uh, in reality, it was just the caterpillars. What makes them worse, though, is that as they start to remove the leaves or as the plant dries down, the caterpillars will move up onto the uh, move up on the plant. They will start feeding on the beards. As you can see, they've fed on some right here. Uh, once the uh, heads dried down too much, though, they will start to clip, and they typically clip the plant right about here, uh, and so seeds will fall off and they'll also feed on those to some extent. So they're just trying to get all the nutrients they can. But if you have a very large population clipping heads, you can imagine it can become a major problem very quickly. So for true army worm, there's really two ways to scout for it. We can scout using visual counts or estimating how much head clipping is occurring. Pretty much any head clipping warrants a spray because these typically do show up in fairly large populations. And if you see a few army worms, chances are there's more out in the field. And so if head clipping starts, that's when we typically recommend taking management action because we don't want a lot of that to occur right before harvest. If it's a little bit earlier in the season, so right the beginning of July into June, we'd recommend using a sweep net. So it's two caterpillars per square yard, and the rough estimate of that for a sweep net is about 40 caterpillars per 30 pendulum swings. Since that, that's where you swing the sweep net, and then you swing it back. That counts as a single sweep. And so we typically don't hit this 40 caterpillars in every field, uh, but when you do see it and you don't manage it, we've seen it in research plots as well as farmer fields, uh, it can cause a lot of problems very fast. So if we're getting closer to harvest, uh, management becomes a little bit trickier because we know that insecticides have pre-harvest intervals. So that's the amount of time you have to wait after that insecticide application to harvest. And so if you're a couple of weeks away from harvest, you don't want to wait 30 days. And 29 to 30 days is kind of the general across the board pre-harvest interval for a lot of insecticides. There are some, now these aren't a fully comprehensive list, some insecticides that target caterpillars specifically uh, that have shorter pre-harvest intervals. Uh, the first one here is Bolton. Bolton has a seven-day pre-harvest interval, uh, so that does cut the window down quite a bit. And the other two are Corrigin and Prevathon, and those have a one-day pre-harvest interval. So if we're getting closer to harvest, uh, the, the main takeaway message here is to make sure you're checking those pre-harvest intervals on the insecticides and make sure that you're choosing an insecticide to manage the pest, but won't further delay harvest because uh, should some weather event or just the fact that the crops are ready and we're not harvesting it can also cause yield losses down the road. So the next two pests are cutworm species. Uh, typically when we think of cutworms, we're probably thinking of dingy cutworms, black cutworms. Uh, they do the traditional where they completely cut the plant, uh, but in wheat, uh, 
we see a little bit di a difference depending on the species. Uh, the first species here is the army cutworm. We'll go into more depth and then the pale western cutworm. Of the two species, we don't really see pale western cutworms a lot in South Dakota, but we are inside their uh, range, so we do watch out for those in the spring. We do see army cutworms on a pretty regular basis. The extent of the defoliation and injury we see to wheat just varies from year to year. But it's something that we definitely watch out for. And part of the reason why army cutworms are such a unusual and hard to determine when they're going to be a major problem each year is just their lifestyle, uh, life cycle. And uh, if we get into a little bit, these hatch in the winter wheat or our, uh, alfalfa fields in the fall. So the moths actually come back in the fall, lay eggs, the eggs have enough time to hatch. And then these caterpillars are robust enough that they can overwinter uh, either in whatever covers present in the field or they will bury themselves a little bit. Uh, but most of the time they're very successful in overwintering because they're cold hardy. And also if we get snow cover, uh, that provides them a nice layer of insulation. This factor right here, though, also allows them to be a major pest earlier in the spring than a lot of our other insects, because as soon as it warms up enough, they're active. Uh, and they can start feeding when it's still pretty cool, as I'll go into some details on that. But uh, they feed very little in the fall, so we don't typically get a good estimate for the populations in the fall, because they typically have a fairly short window of feeding. Then it cool, cools off enough that they stop feeding, they overwinter. As I mentioned, they start feeding as soon as it warms up enough that they can be active in the spring and the snow cover is gone. And if we have large populations, just like uh, our true army worm, anytime you see army in an insect name, it means that they can show up in very large populations and they'll kind of march through a field destroying it as they go. And so we can see some stand loss issues uh, with the army cutworm. The thing with this pest though, is if we catch it on time, and we don't have large patches already removed from the field, or even if we do, if we spray early enough, uh, typically the wheat will be able to rebound and we'll be able to still have a successful harvest off that field. And so this is what army cutworm feeding will look like. It generally starts out as a small patch where it'll look like the plants have just been completely removed. And then it'll spread out from there. And typically the larger the population, the faster that expansion occurs. So for scouting, uh, this is primarily an issue for winter wheat because of the fact that they are searching for those fields in the fall, the moths are, and then the caterpillars are emerging from them in the spring. It can be an issue in spring wheat, though, if they're moving from winter wheat into spring wheat. Uh, so it's just depending on where neighboring fields are, uh, there can be the potential, but primarily an issue for winter wheat fields. If you are observing clipped plants like that picture where it looked like the plant had been mowed off, essentially, the recommendation is to dig around those plants in the row one to two inches deep, and you'll typically be able to find the caterpillars. Uh, so these are a nocturnal feeder. They will typically during the day, unless it's really overcast, they're going to bury themselves a little bit in the cracks, find a place to hide. And so if you're scouting for these in no-till fields, you typically just have to start uh, lifting cover uh, the residue, and you can find them. If you're in a uh, t conventional tillage field, a lot of times they'll kind of find a crack in the soil or uh, bury themselves just a little bit. Once you dug, count how many caterpillars you observe. If you're not finding a lot of caterpillars, you can also estimate the area within the field that's being affected by their feeding. And so the threshold for uh, army cutworm are two to four caterpillars per square foot. And you won't believe it, but that actually sometimes is hard to reach uh, unless you have a very large uh, population. Typically, we go with the, how big of an area of plants is clipped, and there's not really a standard for this, but you can estimate when you're looking at the field if it looks like there's large patches, and if you see more than one patch, that's also an indication that you probably have more than one population within the field, and so that might be your indicator that you need to consider management. And then another thing we ran into this last year is if you have spring drought stress, uh, this can really make this a bigger issue because you need to make sure for those plants to rebound that you have adequate moisture. 
Uh, but you kind of get get into a catch-22 here because if you have drought stress, you're not sure how well the crop's going to do. Uh, but if you don't spray, it's for sure not going to do well. But if you do spray, it still might not do well because of the drought. So, uh, But drought stress will make it more of an issue for the army cutworm populations, just causing that injury to the plants and the plants, whether or not they'll be able to rebound, rebound from it. One of the things with the army cutworm, because it does show up so early in the season that we have to really monitor for, is before we spray, we have to look at the forecast. And we need three to four days into the, the future forecasts where the uh, estimated temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's post-application. The day of application should also be warm, but uh, here in South Dakota, a lot of times we'll have that one or two days where it's nice, uh, and then we can cool off again. We've seen that, especially the last two years. It seems like we kind of are on a roller coaster in the spring for temperatures, uh, but we need to have high daily temperatures above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason for that is when we dip below that, these caterpillars may be feeding, uh, but typically they're not going to be moving around quite as much and they're not going to get exposed to the insecticides. Another thing, since they are more of a nocturnal feeder, we recommend spraying later in the day. This helps promote the coverage. Uh, it helps make sure that the residues are still there when the caterpillars are actually going to feed. So now switching to the pale western cutworm, uh, these, like I said, are not as much of an issue. We typically don't see large populations of these in South Dakota, but it's something we like to stay up on date with because the, about the time we stop worrying about them is when the huge population will show up and cause us a headache. Uh, so these overwinters eggs in the soil. So there's one of the big differences right there. And then they hatch in the spring. So they typically are hatching a little bit later. Uh, they Their activity is also a lot of times later than the army cutworm. Another big difference is, is that the army cutworms will go above ground to feed, then hide again uh, during the day. Pale western cutworms will feed under the soil surface, uh, which also makes them a bigger issue for the wheat plants because, as I said, for the army cutworms, plants can rebound, uh, survive the feeding if we manage them and uh, be able to still make a yield. With the pale western cutworm, because it's feeding under the soil, it's feeding on the growth point, and it will kill the plant. So stand reductions with pale western cutworm will be easy to identify the differences because, number one, they're more of a spring wheat pest, so uh, the spring wheat fields will be more affected. Number two, once the plant's been fed on it, it doesn't have any green left, it'll die. And because of that, the threshold for pale western cutworms is a lot smaller. It's uh, one to two cutworm caterpillars per square foot. We, you notice we don't say the area uh, because a lot of times it's just harder to estimate. Uh, the army cutworm makes the fields look like they've been mowed. Uh, the pale western cutworms, not quite so much. Pyrethroid insecticides are still uh, the recommendation here. They should be applied in the evening to make them more effective. So that's all I have for those first caterpillars. So now we're going to switch over to aphids and uh, cross our fingers. Aphids haven't been a huge issue in wheat now for the last few years, but there's two reasons we worry about aphids in the wheat. Uh, the first is that they can reduce yield by direct feeding. Just having very large populations present can cause yield loss to occur. The other issue is that they can vector barley aldor fires. We do see barley aldor fires show up in South Dakota. However, we typically don't attribute it to being a major yield limiting factor. There are a lot of other issues that we see. So the first species uh, that we can find in South Dakota are the bird cherry oat aphids. They're dark green and they're easy to identify from the other aphids because they have this burnt orange or red patch at the end of their body. They typically migrate to wheat in late spring, early summer, and so uh, in South Dakota, though, we typically don't see very large populations of these in the wheat. Uh, we see a few of the other species a lot more commonly, including the English grain aphid. Uh, so when we're out scouting, this is the aphid we typically will come across. These are kind of a light green color. Uh, big characteristics for them is they're pretty large, and they also have their tailpipes or cornicles are black. They don't have any extra coloration. 
And then they have alternating light and dark patterns on their legs, as well as their antenna. These typically can be found on the leaves, but once we start to get the head formation, that's where they're going to move to. Uh, they can also vector barley outdoor fires. Uh, typically don't see real large populations of these, but once in a while they'll kind of have an explosion and all of a sudden there'll be a lot of them in the field. So it is something to watch for. And then there's green bugs. So of the th three species that we're talking about, this is the smallest species. As you can imagine, it gets its name because it's green. Uh, so uh, they are a light green color. These can be easily identified from the other species besides the fact that they're smaller and all green because when they feed on the leaf, they will cause it to uh, discolor. And so you'll get kind of, it'll almost look like you're getting uh, a rust, but it's actually from these aphids feeding. So uh, there'll also be a lot of evidence. The picture is a little bit hard to tell, but uh, when aphids feed on a plant, they leave a lot of garbage behind, including cast skins, as well as honeydew. The honeydew a lot of times will allow other insects like ants to show up or just mold to show up. So uh, when you're out scouting, keep an eye on that. When you're scouting for aphids, the best recommendation is to walk in a zigzag pattern throughout the field. Stop kind of on the points where you turn, examine five to 10 plants, and then move on. For the management of the aphids, the biggest thing is uh, preventing the green bridge. That's kind of a thing across wheat in general for the insect pests. If we have volunteer wheat or other grasses in the field, that's going to promote a lot of these insect species for showing up. Uh, for some of the species, delaying planting, this can be for spring wheat, can help a little bit. Seed treatments will have quite an impact on the aphid species, especially if they're showing up right after emergence of the plants. But most of the time, we're going to be recommending the use of foliar insecticides. And so that's why it's important to be out scouting and also knowing the thresholds, because if you're trying to use foliar insecticides, you need to know how many aphids have to be on the plant to treat. And unlike some of our other crops, aphids and wheat are a little bit more complicated because we have more susceptible stages and then we have less susceptible stages. Uh, unless we're talking, uh, you know, when we look at the English grain aphid, it actually is kind of, uh, as well as the bird cherry oat aphid, a little bit different from the green bud. Uh, and that's just because of the size, how much they're feeding and what populations. Also the fact that green bugs typically go for the leaves. So for bird cherry oat aphid and English grain aphid, the early stages of wheat can have more aphids on them before we trigger a spray. Once we get to the flowering stage though, we really wanna make sure we don't have aphids during the flowering stage for these two species. Uh, the reason for that is we want to make sure we're getting as much energy of the plant into the flowering and then developing uh, this, the seeds. Once we get into the milky ripe to on the dose stage, though, it jumps up to 10 aphids, still pretty low. That's a field average. And green bug, as I mentioned, is kind of the opposite. It's that emerging plant that we really watch for with green bug because they feed on the leaves and they cause some stunting. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the plant's able to take off. Uh, with the aphids, as I mentioned, there's a few different things, but most of the time, foliar insecticides are going to be our best option. Except for uh, a few cases, most of the time in the fall, we don't see a lot of aphid populations showing up in the wheat. The reason we do see them showing up, though, in the fall is because they, they're coming out of other crops. Typically, they're coming out of corn, so as the corn starts to dry down, it just happens to line up a lot of times for when the winter wheat's starting to emerge. And so the aphids are looking for whatever green grasses they can find these species. And so they'll move into uh, whatever they find. And so seed treatments in winter wheat can be effective as well as in spring wheat, just to slow down or uh, knock those populations down a little bit. With the foliar insecticides, the last few years, the fields I've scouted, I've recommended holding off because when you're out scouting, if you're noticing a lot of the mummies, uh, where there's parasitoid wasp has caused the aphid to turn kind of a white or uh, black color swell up a little bit. Uh, that's an indicator you have a good natural enemy population as well if you see a lot of lady beetles. Uh, so unless the aphids are well above, right at or well above threshold, my recommendation is typically to wait 
another week or so, see how it's going. And then you can tell whether or not the aphids are going to escape that predation or not. So now we're going to jump to the other insects and insect relatives that could be an interest in wheat as we move forward into the next year. This insect has been on my radar for the last couple of years. And in the last year, uh, the reports of it have exploded. And so we're going to talk about it. We're hoping to do some research on it this year. Uh, the research is just going to be a statewide survey to see where wheat stem sulfide are at in South Dakota, because it seems like we're getting reports from counties that historically did not have wheat stem sawflies. So the adults will resemble wasps. They're about three quarters of an inch long. When I say they resemble a wasp, you'll notice the coloration here. So uh, black and yellow pattern. Uh, they do have the clear wings. So flying around, they might give you the impression that they're a wasp. However, uh, they do have different antenna and also the fact that their ovipositor is a little different. So uh, they're not stinging anybody uh, because they actually have kind of a saw-like ovipositor instead of uh, one that's designed for protection. The larvae are cream colored and you won't see these though unless you're actually splitting stems. One of the things to note is that you can kind of see this as this S-shaped pattern. So they'll have that whether you're observing them in the stem or if you've knocked them out of the stem, they'll kind of keep that shape. And so, uh, as I mentioned, though, this is where they're going to be found. They're going to be in the stems, and that's really what causes all of our problems. The adults for these don't actually have uh, functioning mouth parts, so they don't live very long, and they're not really feeding on anything. So emergence of adults begins in May. Uh, we have to have temperatures around 62 degrees Fahrenheit. So once we get above that, for sure, emergence is starting, and it will continue for three to four weeks. This right here makes the control of these very hard because as adults, we can't just have a good time spray when we start to see adults coming out because it's not a fast emergence. Uh, if we have that emergence over you know, a month, it would mean that we'd need two or three sprays to really get an effective reduction of the population moving into the fields. As I mentioned, the adults don't live very long. They live for about seven days. They don't feed on wheat, so they're not the issue other than the fact that they are, the females are laying eggs. Uh, one of the interesting things with these is that the larvae are cannibalistic and they don't like to share. So uh, if you're out in the field and you're scouting for these, you'll Un, it's uh, very unlikely that you'll find one, more than one larva. If you do, it probably means they haven't ran into each other yet. Uh, by the end of the season, though, there will only be one larva per plant. And the larvae will remain in that stem until the wheat begins to dry down. They'll continue to stay in the stem, but what they do is they go down towards the base of the plant and they will feed around uh, the stem. We call that girdling. And then that makes it so that they can emerge easier and then uh, as adults in the next spring, uh, but the larvae will go under that point and then they overwinter there in the base of the plants. And so this is what that looks like uh, when we have that population present. So you can see where uh, it looks like it was cut and that's from that girdling behavior. And then they actually plug the base of the plant up. So it makes a nice little overwintering habitat for them. In the spring, it makes it very easy for them to merge. But you can imagine if you have this occurring, uh, it's one of the concerns we have with the wheat stem sawfly. So just by having the larvae in a plant, we can see somewhere from 10, 2 to 10% yield loss. So uh, imagine you have a very large population present in a field. That can be a 2 to 10% 10, 10 yield loss across the field. Uh, I do mention here, this is almost primarily an issue for hollow stem varieties. Uh, the reason for that is the hollow stems make it easier for them to move in the plant. Solid stems are actually considered to be one of the resistant uh, types because they can't take advantage of the wheat plant as easily. Now, that 2 to 10% yield loss is a, enough of a concern, but due to how they feed on the plants, the wheat won't just necessarily lodge right away. But if we get wind, which... Uh, you know, into July, mid-August, it's un not unusual for us to have a storm roll through. We can see 50% yield loss due to severe lodging. And in some cases, uh, if we look at what our neighbors in Montana can have, uh, they have been having very large populations this past for the last few years. 
uh, you can see even greater than 50% yield loss because almost an entire field will go down. And so if that if that happens, you can imagine it's very hard to harvest. And that's where that yield loss is actually coming from, just because it's nearly impossible to lift that grain up to harvest. Here in South Dakota, uh, we, we know we have populations, the wheat stem sawfly, they've primarily been identified in the Northwestern counties. Uh, there's been some research that my predecessor here at SDSU did some research uh, on wheat stem sawfly, looking at the effects of a couple of varieties on it. Uh, but older reports also say northern counties, so you can imagine it can be kind of a line across the northern counties, but we know for sure it's in the northwestern counties. Now, I don't have it listed here. It's very likely that it's also in our southwestern counties as well, because researchers in, in Nebraska have identified it in the counties uh, that border South Dakota down in the southwest. So uh, there's a good chance that we probably have it down there as well. So for scouting, uh, the, the best thing to do in the spring is to scout for adults. And the easiest way to do that is using sweet bets. They are weak flyers, and they typically the fields will have an edge effect that are infested. So the edge of the field will be more heavily infested than as you get into the center of the field. And so you can start there, but it's important to kind of walk through the entire field to get an idea uh, if the infestation is just starting, uh, if they're just moving into the field or how far they've gone. Once you've identified that the adults are present in the field, the next thing you really need to do is to split stems to look for the larva. And so, as I mentioned, there's only one per stem, so you have to split quite a few to get an idea uh, of how, how severe the infestation is. Once we get to the point where they're already in the field, uh, it's too late, there are no rescue treatments. So you can imagine we can't get anything down into the stems uh, once the larvae are present in them. And another thing to do is before harvest, evaluate the fields, determine if you have cut plants or if fields are starting to have evidence of lodging, that would be an indication that you need to try to harvest as fast as possible. And as, like I said, no rescue treatments after infestations occurred. Previous research says insecticides aren't profitable. Uh, the reason for that is, as I mentioned, it requires at least three sprays to really reduce the adult populations. Even when you do that, you're seeing somewhere in the ballpark of a 3.3 bushel per acre increase. And you have to think about the fact that you've sprayed three times. And you, you can't spray all in one week. It needs to be about once a week because of that three to four week emergence period. So not the best option. Best option by far are the solid stem varieties. They do work well, but there's a catch. Uh, we recommend only using these in areas with identified heavy infestations because most solid stem varieties will yield somewhere in the 10 to 15% less ballpark when compared to the hollow stem varieties. And so uh, that's that's the catch there is it will prevent the uh, wheat stem sawfly from causing the severe lodging, but it will just on on average yield a little bit less. So this is why we really want to survey South Dakota in 2023 because we can help identify those areas where the, the threat is present and where the heavier infestations are likely uh, because the use of Holliston varieties should be pretty targeted in those areas and we shouldn't just go across the board using it. Next pest is wheat curl mite, which in and of itself is not a huge problem, but it does carry a disease uh, that it will transmit to the plants. And that's where it really becomes an issue. So they're very small. You, you need a magnifying glass of some sort to see them. They're cigar shaped. They're going to typically be in the ribs of the leaves. So you can imagine this is already under magnification just to see them. The adults are so small, they can get carried on the wind, and that's how they move from field to field. They overwinter on green plant material, and then they move from field to field using green bridges. So those volunteer wheat plants, volunteer grasses, really are what they use to move from field to field. The best management option here for these is to delay planting. I've seen fields that have just been decimated by uh, the wheat streak mosaic virus that these transmit. And there's not a lot we can do. So once they show up in a field, there aren't insecticides. A lot have been tested. Uh, Nothing has just worked real effectively at reducing the population. So the best thing to do is prevention. 
another pest that we might see or might not, depending on the spring, I guess we'll have to kind of wait and see uh, what our moistures are like, uh, moisture levels as well as temperatures. But we did see this a couple of years ago where slugs, these do require very cool, wet conditions. So we need lots of moisture, cooler temperatures, and they're primarily an issue in no-till fields. So they need high crop residue. Uh, that's what they use to kind of hide during the day. They use that to help protect themselves. More of a spring issue if they are going to be a problem because of the fact that once it warms up, we tend to dry out and then it's not as uh, good of an environment for them. They don't actually feed through the plants, but they scrape the leaves and the stems. And when they start doing that, you can see that you start to have where the plants will actually start to collapse. And also you just lose leaf tissue. So they will reduce stands also by feeding on germinating seeds. So we watch out for slugs. We don't really have management recommendations for them because they don't show up a lot. Uh, we've had a few fields in the last couple of years where they were a problem. So it's more of a watch and we try to figure out what to do once we identify a field. Another pest that I get asked a about a lot is the wheat stem maggot. And it's actually uh, actually our pathologist who typically gets asked about this pest first, but wheat stem maggot in South Dakota is a very minor pest, even though a lot of times you go out in a field and you'll see a lot of the bleached heads, because even though the heads will be bleached, there's not a large amount of yield loss occurring with it. And this is the larva that's causing all of the problems. They're actually, the adults are a small fly. Here's the larvae. It's not much to look at, but they'll feed on uh, the, in the stem and their feeding will actually cut off the nutrient flow to the head. And the easiest way to identify these from, uh, which is I believe a scab that can also cause the bleaching of the heads is to actually pull on the head a little. A slight tug on a plant that's been infested by wheat stem maggot will result in the, the head just being easily removed. So once you do that, you'll see that there's a small area at the base of it that you can see where there's been a little bit of feeding down here uh, within the stem. And that's your indication. If it doesn't pull out, then you have a disease. Uh, but we've seen lots of fields that have this uh, insect, but all the previous research indicates that it's not a, a major yield loss factor. Next pests can be a major yield loss factor. So grasshoppers can be a major problem in wheat. And it's something that we're going to really closely monitor as we move into 2023. And the reason for that is we've already had a couple of years where we had increased grasshopper populations. And a couple of years ago, Montana had very large grasshopper populations and uh, as a result of that, we probably got kind of a population increase just from that. So uh, the, in, the species they were seeing a lot of were the red-legged grasshopper. We've been seeing in South Dakota a lot of red-legged, the two-striped, as well as the differential. And so it really just differs a little bit on what part of the state you're in. These can be found across the state, but it seems like the populations take off in different areas of the state. The uh, species can be different on what they're causing problems. Another factor besides just having very large populations the last couple of years is that we've had now uh, from 2020 to 2022, pretty favorable falls. Uh, we've had Later frost, so 2022 frost was earlier in some parts of the state, but still fairly uh, average or slightly behind average as far as when the frost occurred. 2021 was a very late frost, and the longer we have to wait until that first frost, and not just when it hits 32, we need to hit 28. So you can imagine that uh, has taken us a little bit longer the last couple of years. That's the killing frost. Uh, the longer we have to wait until we hit that, the more time these grasshoppers that are out in the fields have time to lay eggs. And so the more time they have to lay eggs, the larger potential there is for a big population the next year. And so another factor is drought. And we've had some pretty dry years and it's looking like we might have another one. Uh, it's hard to say, just looking, I talked with our state climatologist, Laura Edwards yesterday, and she said that right now they're kind of looking at snowfall uh, and so the drought monitor page hasn't really updated a lot, but uh, looking at the map, it still looks like we're pretty dry throughout South Dakota. And the reason we care so much is 
this is what can happen. I know this isn't wheat, but this is uh, from our research. Of all our research plots, this is probably the most devastating uh, picture we have of what grasshoppers can do in a short amount of time. So uh, this is in 2020. There was grass that got sprayed to our north. And then in a week, we were out there, looked at these one week, and the next week we came back and this is what we saw. Uh, and in some cases, it's kind of hard to see in the picture because we are mainly trying to get the leaves. Uh, they even fed on the heads. So uh, here's a good picture of what uh, they look like when they're uh, feeding on the heads. But it's mainly kind of drive home the point that a large grasshopper population caused a lot of problems really fast. And in this same area, the next year, uh, this population resulted in a large spring population, which actually wiped out uh large part of a field of sunflowers. And so uh, the middle of the field was saved, but probably 300 feet, 400 feet around the edges had to be replanted. And so if you've had grasshopper populations in 2022 uh, that were close to or warranted insecticide application, really consider monitoring those areas in 2023 in the spring, because there's a good likelihood that uh, you could have some issues. So if we jump to my prediction, uh, I don't have the crystal ball, but this is my prediction looking at the factors that we know. Uh, we've had a couple years of dry conditions, drought. We've had 2021 had a very late frost. 2022 is earlier, but it wasn't really early enough. Uh, we got cold, but we didn't get cold enough. So grasshoppers did remain active. So we are likely to see large populations in 2023. A lot of this depends on our spring conditions though. If we have a cool, wet spring, it can slow them down. If we stay dry, uh, you know, even if we get some moisture, uh, one of the other things is if we have moisture in the spring, grasshoppers will have plenty to feed on. But as soon as that starts to go away, if we dry down again, uh, they will move into our fields. And this is the drought monitor map, uh, most recent update that I, uh, could find. And pretty much what we see here, as Laura pointed out to me, is it still shows that throughout the state we have some level of drought. Chances are this will change slightly uh, once they evaluate uh, the thaw, uh, snow thaw in the spring, uh, is what Laura uh, told me yesterday. But kind of what I want to point out is that we went into the fall pretty dry. Uh, we had a fairly dry fall. And we started off in some areas with quite a bit of snow, but, you know, it's been a while since we've had snow of, you know, considerable amount in a lot of parts of the state now. And I think that we're going to potentially see some issues. I'm not a climatologist, so take this part with a grain of salt, but uh, this is typically what I use to estimate where our grasshopper populations are going to be throughout the year. Looking at the drought monitor map, you can kind of get an idea for where the more severe droughts are. Typically where the more severe droughts are where we're going to see the insect pressure in the crops. So there are, as I mentioned, several species of grasshoppers capable of causing major defoliation. Most of the time in wheat, it's going to be an edge effect to start with. And so if we catch it early enough, sometimes we can get away with just treating the margins of the field. So maybe one or two passes with a sprayer. In the fall, emerging winter wheat can have a lot of issues with grasshopper populations. And you can imagine in the spring, if we already have large populations, we can have issues too. Uh, the reason for that is young grass uh, coming up. So young wheat is uh, kind of a food of choice for grasshoppers. And so it's really important to watch here in the spring and then also in the fall, depending on what the weather looks like uh, for grasshoppers feeding on the emerging wheat. The thresholds for these, we don't really look at defoliation. It's much easier to stand and count how many we're seeing moving in a square yard. So I don't, don't recommend actually taking something out to fully measure a square yard, but you can kind of estimate, you can take something that's, uh, you know, take a yardstick out and estimate that distance from yourself and get used to what that looks like around yourself for a square yard. It's eight to 14 adults per square yard and then 30 to 45 nips per square yard. And this is a little bit deceiving because you might think, well, that means that we need to probably be treating at an adult stage because that's its lower numbers. Uh, it's harder to reach 30 to 45 nymphs. Yes and no. If we have that many nymphs, it's pretty obvious. 
uh, will know that we have a problem in the field. And it's not that hard to count to 30 uh, when you're counting the grasshopper nymphs because they move so much. But the reason we want to actually treat the nymphs and not the adults is the nymphs are easier to kill. The smaller the grasshopper, uh, the less developed it is, the easier it is to reduce its population with insecticides. Once they've reached adulthood, they're robust. Uh, they just tend to be a lot harder to kill. And again, 8 to 14 adults isn't a lot in a square yard. I've seen fields in the last year where uh, I stopped counting when I hit about 100, and it more or less looked like the ground was moving. And so when you get to those populations, it is time to spray. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're standing still and it looks like the entire surface of the ground is moving and it's due to grasshopper nymphs, uh, you far exceeded threshold and it's probably time to spray. Catching those when they're just emerging is excellent because they haven't done a lot of feeding yet and you can really reduce those populations quickly. So uh, the best for wheat, best recommendation are probably the foliar insecticides. Insecticide seed treatments, especially in the fall, can be beneficial. It'll slow the grasshoppers down. However, it won't stop them completely. Uh, another thing you can do with wheat is plant a higher population around the field margins. And then, you know, I've been asked how far? Well, maybe one to 200 feet. Uh, sometimes that's enough. The grasshoppers will move in. By planting a higher population, you're allowing for some crop destruction to occur. And then hopefully before the entire edge of the field gets wiped out, it gets cold. Uh, so that's kind of the thought process there. Uh, the next pests aren't actually a pest of wheat in the field as much as they are after harvest or at harvest. There's two species of weevils. Uh, we've had questions about these in the past, so I just have left this in. The rice weevil and the maize weevil can both show up and be a pest of storage. Rice weevils are going to be uh, a light brown. They kind of have a light colored X on their back. They have a shorter snout. The adults and larvae will both feed on the wheat seeds. These are not a strong flyer. Whoops, excuse that. These are not a strong flyer, so most of the time they'll stay around bin sites or they'll have to be transmitted to the bin uh, from the field. These require a high moisture content. So bad infestation of rice weevils a lot of times will indicate that your bin is too humid and you need to have a fan on it or how you're storing the grain, it's gotten too humid, which can also lead to other issues. The other pest is a maize weevil. It has a short snout also. They're going to be a little bit darker in color. Both are uh, the adults and larvae can feed on the seeds. These are strong flyers, so a lot of times if we see these moving around, it's the maize weevils. And for both species, uh, if you are seeing these as you're harvesting, you know, if you notice them in the grain tank of the bin uh, or the combine, if you notice them in the bin of the combine, uh, best recommendation is a grain cleaner. And I know that slows down everything, but uh, removing them is very effective. Another thing is to consider wherever you're storing your wheat uh, to do a pre-bin treatment with malathion or another product that's labeled. Another thing you can do is a protectant insecticide, and I didn't list those, but there are quite a few options, and you apply those right at the auger as you're binning. So that is all I have for you guys today, and I thank you again for your attention. Here are a few slides for your information. And then if you need to get a hold of me or you have additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I am on leave until the first week of March. So uh, I came in today just to make sure I could give this talk, but my office number during the summer is a little bit harder to reach me at because I typically will be out in the field scouting, uh, but you can leave me a voicemail. I will try to get to you. Probably the more reliable source is to reach out to me on either the email, which I will try to respond to uh, as fast as I see it, or you can try on Twitter, but I will also state that I don't, especially during the winter, I don't really check my Twitter. I use that more to update on pests as we're seeing them in the season. So uh, again, thank you for your, your time and for your attention.